Uh, welcome to, back to, if you've been away, to our uh, Big Talk from Small Libraries 2020. I am Krista Porter, your host here at the Nebraska Library Commission. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Big Talk with Small Libraries is sponsored by the Association for Rural and Small Libraries and the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, we are an annual conference and we do, um, we have presenters that are all from uh, libraries or universities, public libraries, health libraries that serve populations of 10,000 or less. Uh, and right now on the, on the conference, we have with us Copper Queen Library, who is, as you can see there, the best small library in America 2019. Congratulations. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and with us is uh, Jason and Allison from uh, the library, um, and they're going to talk about um, their experience and the things that they do at their library there in, in Arizona. So I'll just hand it over to you guys to introduce yourself and tell us all about the library. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us, Krista. It's, uh, it's quite an honor to, to join you all today. And um, I'm here with Allison Williams. Uh, she's our program coordinator. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are so pleased to be a part of this conference. Mm -hmm. well, so uh, today we're just, we're going to um, talk a, a little bit about what we've uh, accomplished over the last um, four years. Alice and I have been working together um, to make the biggest impact in our community. And uh, we, we've accomplished some really amazing things. So we're gonna highlight some of those. Um, first, we're gonna start with uh, just who we are and where we are. Um, we are in Bisbee, Arizona, and that's in the Southeast corner of Arizona, about 90 miles uh, Southeast of Tucson. Um, we are a rural community and uh, we are, Bisbee is an old copper mining town. Um, in its heyday, it was called the Queen of the Copper Camps. So uh, really interesting history in our library. It's our folklore and we love to share this story. Um, we had, um, our library was started in 1885 and it's kind of got an interesting uh, start point. Uh, we had uh, principal members of the Copper Queen Mining Company. Um, they came to Bisbee to check it out and upon their arrival, um, the story goes that they found a swinging corpse of a fellow that was hanged the night before and they were so shocked by this site uh, that they decided immediately the town needed more civilized diversions and oh my yeah yeah, I yeah. Agree. <laughs> so uh, thus in 1882 uh, the Copper Queen Library was established and it started in the corner of the um, the Copper Queen uh, store the mining store and um, and in 1885, we got our first building that you can see there on the screen. Um, and that building burned and we got the 1892 beautiful building. Um, and as Bisbee grew, uh, that building was actually demolished to create our 1907 building where we are housed today. And that's where Allison and I are presenting from. Um, so, So a little bit about Bisbee. Um, Bisbee serves the residents, uh, about uh, 5,500 uh, people live in Bisbee. Um, and we are located in the Mule Mountains, um, eight miles from the Mexican border. Um, back in its heyday, Bisbee's population was over 25,000. Uh, but when the mines closed in the 1970s, uh, most of Bisbee's population left to look for work elsewhere. Um, and it left the window open for um, an eclectic group of artists and uh, writers, poets, musicians, and for lack of a better word, hippies um, came into town and uh, they started to recreate the urban landscape. Um, and this is our evolution here, kind of um, takes us to where we are today. Um, Today's Bisbee attracts retirees and travelers, as well as a younger generation of entrepreneurs and creatives uh, looking to escape bigger cities like Tucson and Phoenix. Um, and it really is this, uh, this interesting mix of peoples and cultures um, that has created this extremely diverse and very engaged community. Um, and over the past four years, Allison and I have really been able to tap into this community and we really do consider it um, our most valuable asset. Um, and it's enabled us to do uh, some amazing things, um, which led to winning our um, Best Small Library Award. And as well, this 
um, influx when this town was, the mine closed down and the mining corporation actually gave the library to the city of Bisbee in 1976. And that's approximately the same time when the influx of artists and poets and hippies all came in. And that too made its mark on, we're known as an artist town. Um, we're, we're definitely known as a, a cultural town, both in the history, but in, in um, arts and really amazing events. So we have evolved through this 138 years, the library standing strong and embracing knowledge, as you can see, building community and inspiring curiosity as part of our mission. Um, so when we, um, as librarians, we identify the needs and then we look at what the barriers are to providing these resources and services to our community. And um, the city of Bisbee is, uh, when I first moved here, it, it reminded me of the five boroughs of Manhattan with uh, where the library is, Old Bisbee being uh, Manhattan and uh, Warren being Brooklyn and on and on. So San Jose, where our new annexes is the closest to the Mexican border and the farthest away, the neighborhood farthest away from our um, historic building. So Cochise County is geographically spread out. In Cochise County, every student can go to any school in Cochise County. That's because of the geographical barriers. As well, any resident in Cochise County can have a library card at any library in Cochise County. And we just moved to a one card, one county system, which is just fantastic. Um, one library card for all the libraries, both city and uh, county district libraries. And that just kind of illuminates how we um, resource share and how spread out we are and how people actually travel a lot. However, the neighborhood of San Jose, which is the uh, closest to the border and the farthest away from us, it has the largest population of children actually. And we found that um, the smallest amount of those residents were patrons regularly coming to our library. As well, a uh, couple years ago, the county had to um, end their, their bookmobile program, which um, we have a lot of unincorporated areas around the city proper that are so close to the city, most people think they are part of the city. And when the bookmobile services stopped, that isolated this whole area from services in a, in a pretty dramatic way. So we, we looked to bring the mountain to Muhammad. We, um, identified spaces in that neighborhood. And really, we couldn't have done this without the Bisbee Unified School District. Um, there was an abandoned school there, a school that had been closed. And it was closed for 10 years, just they couldn't reopen it. But uh, under the rules of the school district, they had to keep the lights on. So there was electricity. Um, and maintenance. However, there were no occupants. So we had the unique and remarkable opportunity. Um, we asked for a classroom in this empty building in this neighborhood, and we were given this classroom. Uh, one of our goals was to address the, um, the failure rate in English language arts in the Bisbee Unified School District all three schools having a 65% failure rate of ELA and how we can best reach the children. And um, we decided to start at the beginning looking at preschool literacy programs as well as the geographical location. And so this is the, this is the birth of the idea to create this annex in San Jose. So, um at the same time that we were looking at this, um, we saw that there were other organizations uh, around town that were also trying to um, address the, some of the problems in, in early childhood literacy. And one of the first steps um, that, we were, uh, that we wanted to accomplish was to 
kind of rein all those organizations in together under one umbrella and work together um, as one team to accomplish something even bigger. Um, we noticed that we started hearing that one group or another was um, also attacking literacy, which is fantastic. However, none of them were working together and we are a great believer in adapting ideas rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, it cuts down on the workload with a small staff and we all these different resources of um, community members and groups. We reached out to so many of them and um, we created a little uh, literacy advisory group um, that was specific to preschool literacy from members of all these different organizations. That's one of the uh, one of the biggest things about Bisbee is that um, it, it is just filled with uh, organizations and nonprofits who are identifying specific needs in the community that um, and working really hard to make changes. Um, and as Allison and I started reaching out to organizations, it kind of spread. Um, and we had organizations reaching out to us to participate. Um, and being a, a very uh, central location and just the identity of the library, these organizations uh, trusted us um, and to come in and to, to help and to make a difference. So you can see from that page, I don't even know if this is everything, but it, it's we're, we're just, our community is so much stronger with all these organizations and it's, I think we found it rather easy to find different ways to work specifically with each one um, and really uh, enacting change, positive change. And if I could just mention a couple of these partners. Um, so the Bisbee Unified District, the school district, the Puma logo is um, uh, an amazing partner and they provided the physical space um, and resources to make this happen. But we also use the Bisbee High School CTE construction class to, uh, they volunteered to build bookshelves for us. The Step Up Bisbee NACO group is similar to Habitat for Humanity. They do um, repairs to homes and buildings for low income uh, people in our community. And they were inspired by us and started working with us and the construction class. So we had contractors and architects designing really good plans for the space and for the shelves that the students then built for us. They did these as a volunteer and under a grant process. And then um, the Friends of the Copper Queen Library, we cannot neglect them. Our friends are an amazing, amazing board and group of people who do so much, work really hard to support um, programming for, and collections for us through fundraising. And um, working with the school was not new to us either. Do you want to talk about the registration? Yeah, so um, when, uh, about four years ago when I first started here and Jason came back as director of the library, we reached out to the school district to find out how we could better partner. And the first thing we did was we created a patron card registration form that was included in all the regist school res registration packets in all three schools, realizing that they have the same um, vetting process that we do, checking residency, IDs, address, and all of that. So it's very easy as for us to create a box for staff to just check that they had checked the same things that we would. They, we attached this form to all the registration, the parents filled it out, the school sent us the forms, we created patron cards and sent them off to all the children. I think over the last three years, we've created over 600 new youth patron cards, which in our small population is relatively amazing. And that was our phase one. We then reached out to the school librarians and to all three schools and the principals of those schools to do various programs, outreach going into the schools, but also having um, them come here. We uh, created a program, Coffee with the Principal, with all three principals coming to the library and talking to um, the public. 
Uh, we started a haunted library and that is run by the middle school builders club and the high school um, students. Uh, mapping that out, creating it, working on it. And um, we have a lot other of other programs that the teens uh, and the youth from the schools are primarily responsible for creating. But then when we moved, we, we created this relationship. People, um, it's so good to know who people are, to know their names. Uh, we're also a very small community, so there are patrons as well, these teachers and principals and students. But through growing this relationship, when we came to the point where we asked for this space, um, it was, we had already established our our creds, as it were. We had established that we were committed to um, growing literacy in the schools in our student body. So uh, a little bit about um, the physical space of, uh, or the, where the building exists uh, that our classroom is in. We call it the Annex. It's the um, Copper Queen Library Annex uh, in the San Jose neighborhood. Um, and it's basically uh, an empty classroom that we were given. Uh, all utilities, amazingly, all uh, utilities, including free internet um, paid for by the Bisbee Unified School District. Um, and uh, also close to uh, Naco, Arizona, which is uh, lies on the border with Mexico and the sister city of Naco, Sonora, Mexico um, is right on the other side of the border. And Naco, Arizona has only a K through eight school. So after eighth grade, all of the students from that school feed into Bisbee High School, uh, as do many of the smaller communities surrounding Bisbee. So once high school is reached, there's a whole new influx of students from the surrounding areas. So um, uh, attacking literacy, as it were, at such an early age, and providing services to the surrounding schools. And it's not just NACO, we provide services to the preschools, the Head Starts, to other charter schools and to homeschoolers as well. All building uh, um, bridges between all of the education branches in our community. And also I just wanted to uh, just say, the Annex is not a separate library. It is an offsite collection. It's a collection in a different physical location. And again, finding this way to do, to make this project work, we couldn't establish a whole new library, but we could establish this offsite collection, which gave us this ability to do a huge project on a manageable scale. Um, and, and also uh, students from Naco, Sonora, Mexico cross through customs each day to, to go to school in Naco, um, Arizona. So um, really we're, we're affecting patrons from both sides of the border. And so they come, they, so they, those kids come to your annex as well? Yes, they are technically have residency in the United States um, in order to enroll in the school district. However, um, especially at the NACO Elementary K through eight, there is a large influx of students who cross that border every morning and every afternoon. And um, we are a bilingual community and for many, English is a second language. But it's also the broader picture of parents. While students um, might speak English fluently, there's also the communication barrier with um, interactions with parents and getting parent engagement. And we're able to provide resources to cross this international boundary, the That's wall great. as it were. That's awesome, I love that. <laughs> um, so, and this neighborhood also, so there's, um, that is the most um, family homes uh, where the, our annex location is. And it's within walking distance of a lot of those homes and apartment complexes. Um, so just the central location in terms of that. And it's kind of hard to explain Bisbee because it, it is a, it's a small town. And like Allison said, our, our boroughs are very distinct and separate. Um, and we've got a lot of uh, just physical barriers in the way. I mean, we've got a giant open pit where copper was mined separating uh, where we are, we, we call Old Bisbee, 
um, from the rest of the town. And we've thought, we've also got the the geography of the mountains that um, that create these physical uh, geographic barriers. Um, so it, it is hard for some of these neighborhoods to um, visit us in Old Bisbee. We've we've um, we're a tourist community. Uh, parking is it comes at a premium. It's it's very difficult. It's um, a nightmare. <laughs> um, and it's a lot of people that live outside of Old Bisbee. Uh, unfortunately, they, they've had to give up um, on coming here because it's sometimes just not worth the fight for them to find parking. So this really um, could not have worked out better for us. And I, I think, you know, when we look at providing services and, and eliminating barriers and, and building bridges, um, this 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 begins to really check off a lot of boxes on our library mission. So um, I love before and after pictures, and this kind of gives you an idea of um, what we um, were given. I mean, this empty space when Allison and I walked in there, we were just like, this is ours? Like, oh my gosh, we, we just, we started the, you know, our, the wheels started spinning and, you know, lining up potential partnerships and people who were interested. Um, everyone just kind of came together uh, under this one roof. And that's uh, the second picture is the um, the CTE class, the construction class, uh, building the shelves. And uh, this project gave them such uh, community investment. Um, and uh, all the participants, all the students who helped build those, they signed their names. Uh, on the, the, what was it? The, the bottom of a table that they created for our, our workshop programs, this long low table for the kids. And yeah, they've all signed it. And it's so valuable to have students do real work in real life, as opposed to doing a project in the school classroom that they bring home to their mom and, and it gets put in the basement basically. Um, they're very invested in in this project and as a res result invested in the library um so okay, we did um you know we, we are a small library um we do not have money so we had to start looking at um grants and and possibilities of bringing money in specifically for this project um we knew we needed a lot in terms of um, collections and materials and furniture, um, computer equipment, printer, um, you know, when we, we started tallying it all up, um, we realized that we were going to have to start looking elsewhere for possibilities. And we, we were successful in, in uh, writing two major grants. Um, one of them was to the Arizona State Library, um, an LSTA grant, um, which was for collections and furniture. Um, and computer equipment. And then we also wrote a grant to... To Freeport McMoran, which is the mining concern, not the original mine owner, but uh, that was um, sold to Freeport about uh, over 10 years ago. So Freeport McMoran, our mine is no longer a working functional mine. However, it is still, um, there's still a, a presence here with soil reclamation, as well as we um, lease a, a mine tour. So we there that's one of our tourist attractions is going in into the mine tunnels. And Freeport McMoran has a community grant foundation, but one of the things that they're remarkable for funding is staff. Um, so when we wrote this grant for $40,000, we allocated uh, 20,000 of it for staff, which enabled us to fund a part-time employee for one year with a vision presented to eventually have this become a uh, permanent city-funded employee over while we had a three-year plan for that. We are incredibly lucky that our city manager, our mayor and council saw the value in this space and the value in this employee and funded this position as permanent within one year of the creation of it. This is a remarkable accomplishment for wow, um, yeah. our city and for our library. Um, after so many years of cuts, I can't tell you. 
but uh, they too saw the vision. They too participated, our mayor and council, in um, understanding the need um, for these resources. So Freeport MacRam, we were able to have uh, $40,000. The LSTA grant was $25,500. And on top of that, we had a lot of smaller uh, partners. So in-kind uh, donation by volunteering, Step Up Bisbee Naco, uh, donating wood and the plans, but also individuals who donated $500 here, $500 there. Rotary gave us 1,000. Um, these small, small amounts from local individuals and organizations are as powerful as the large numbers in the representation of how many members of our community were standing behind us in creating this epic project. Um, yeah, and, and when, I think the when we were looking at furnishing this space, we did not want this to be an afterthought. We wanted to provide a really vibrant space with, with new things in it um, that were uh, specifically for this neighborhood. Um, we wanted it to look beautiful and um, and it does. It, it's, it's, it's an amazing feat and to look, to, to look back at these uh, pictures of the empty room with the boarded up windows and to see now um, this beautiful space that's, that's being used, it's amazing. And another thing we did was we replicated, uh, um, and I, I get to brag about Jason here, which is that he has an amazing ability and vision to look at space and reconfigure it and redesign it to use space in the best way possible. And this was designed with a, a mini children's library and a mini adult library, a mini compute, public computer station, and then a work table, a maker space, our staff computer, and all of this fit into this one classroom with some low shelving and um, furniture, but it's also the same furniture that we had recently bought for the main library. So there's a feeling of familiarity and continuity and um, and also a space for um, the adult collection, mini adult collection, mini DVD collection, all of that. So that really was just a shell of a building then there when um, for a long time before that you were able to use it. Yep, yep, Look, board it up. That first um, picture there, yeah. But we have some exciting things to say about that in yeah, a minute coming, too. Yeah, coming up. So, um, so we knew right away that our focus on this space was going to be early literacy and parent engagement. Um, and our early literacy coordinator that we hired through the Freeport grant uh, started designing and implementing um, preschool programs. Um, and we um, started to uh, tap into volunteer resources. Um, and when we we first opened, we thought we'd be open for maybe 16 hours a week, and we had such a great um, response to our volunteer call that immediately we were open 28 and a half hours a week. Yeah, and I I don't know how other small libraries are. We have a really good uh, volunteer team here at the main library, but we um, had a volunteer open house uh, a couple weeks before we officially opened the annex. And we had 40 people show up and fill out volunteer forms, 40 new people uh, who wanted to help us. Uh, that to me was an astonishing day. And one of our um, regular volunteers, she had gone door to door in the entire neighborhood, knocking and talking to people and handing them an invitation to come. So that's that's the kind of support that makes something like this viable. Yeah, and um, this has given an opportunity for our, our volunteer base to really expand on what they do. I mean, I think for many years, volunteers were just asked to shelve books here. And now it's volunteers are using their skills that, you know, a lot of our volunteers are retired, but they're retired teachers and psychologists and professors and- PhD. Yeah, and, and they're using their skills now to help um, facilitate preschool programs. Um, our open play is so much more than just um, a, a play group for uh, kids. It's, it's bringing in, 
um, professionals and having a very informal way for, for parents to react, uh, to interact with um, people of, you know, that in professions that can help them with parenting and, and uh, being engaged with their children. Um, it, it really, it, it's, every volunteer has brought such a very special and unique uh, perspective to this project. And it's just, it's fun finding uh, a job for everyone. And, and so far we've been really good at, at doing that. Um, so, uh, so um, when we asked for this classroom and we're told yes and had the agreement and started moving in, the building was empty. But pretty quickly, the school superintendent decided to move the administrative offices over into this building. So immediately, half of the building office space was uh, renovated and the district office staff moved in. That, that it alone was wonderful because we were willing to be alone, but we <laughs> wanted more life in this, in this community. A boarded building um, has a really detrimental effect on a neighborhood. It's, the word blight is accurate. People feel um, ignored and um, as soon as they moved in and we moved in, um, a new, you can see the Bisbee Science Lab logo up there in yellow. They were so impressed with what we were doing and they are, they were just down the street from the main library. They wanted to come over to San Jose and to the annex, so they asked for a classroom. Um, at the same time, the U of A Cooperative Extension 4-H Club also asked if they could have a classroom. So within six months, um, there were multiple programs occurring, the hallways filled with children. As well, we did not um, keep ourselves isolated and reached out to these other groups and in fact sm formed a small coalition where we met all together to look at our programming schedules and make sure that our programs were complementary, that they did not compete but rather um, made it so that we had accessible programming to children um, at almost every day of the week. We started this last summer with the summer reading program. We included them in our summer reading program schedule so that families would know that every day of the week there was something for them to do. And we are continuing that collaborative relationship. So, as with any project, we've, you get uh, unintended uh, consequences. And um, one of the first things that we saw was that a lot of adults uh, wanted to be a part of library services. They wanted um, to be, um, to have resources and, uh, and a lot of teens uh, also wanted space and um, a collection for them. And this is great. I mean, this is exactly the organic growth that we wanted to see. And um, not even, well, a little over a year since we opened, we are already in the process of expanding into another classroom. Um, and this is so super exciting for us. And we're, we're uh, within the next two months, um, we're gonna be working on um, furnishing another classroom that would house the adult collection. So you can see, this is the pictures are on the other side of that children's section. Uh, there is a small uh, adult collection of books and DVDs. And um, it's just, it's not meeting the needs of our patrons. And um, so we uh, approached our city manager and the uh, Bisbee Unified School District again to see if uh, obtaining another room was a possibility. and. Um, they were quick to sign off on a yes. <laughs> so it's it's very exciting. You can see that um, the second photo is uh, our adult living room and adult collection. That will um, move across the hall into this larger um, classroom. Also, I, I would like to mention that Cochise County Library District is another amazing um, partner as um, they are going, they are recently moving and they are going to be providing uh, shelves that they don't need from their move and also giving us access to their 
collection of adult fiction and nonfiction that we will be able to place in our library. It's we're all because we're all under one catalog, we can be the new home and every library has access, every patron still has access to them. In fact, more access is the way that district is looking at it because they're um, more administrative and not all necessarily open to the public. Um, so the, the existing adult area is going to become our new our new teen center. Um, so we're going to um, deck it out with some fun, colorful... Um, Retro 20th century modern <laughs> furniture. That's so cool. Um, and uh, we're working on some uh, grants to provide um, teen resources, uh, including books. And we're working with um, an organization called Kids Need to Read and Grow Your Library, who are donating over 700 uh, kids' books to this project. Which, yeah, is a, just an amazing partner and opportunity. Um, so, we'd like to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the programs that we have done in the last four years. Um, Kind of some new things for us. The the first thing is the that I am so proud of and just love is the Library of Things. Creating a Library of Things seemed daunting at first um, with the lack of shelf space, um, as did creating a seed library. But with the help of one of our um, amazing front desk employees, who's also a master gardener, um, she was able to help us in creating this. Uh, seed library which does not take up a lot of room and in fact we just reused a ca card catalog uh, unit and it is so active and we created those are a card perfect for that I see that in lots of libraries that th those drawers are just perfect for this they're this perfect <laughs> they're perfect and it actually doesn't take as much in terms of um, physical space and money to create it. We buy larger seed packages and then we break them down into individual amounts. We've also gotten several grants um, from seed libraries, from seed uh, foundations that will provide it. But we also, through a, a Arizona Libraries grant, um, created a hotspot, a Wi-Fi hotspot program. So we have 45 Wi-Fi hotspots that is pretty much the most successful in-demand uh, program in the, that we have um, with a holds list of 30 to 40 people at almost all times. Um, we also have pickleball sets, bocce ball sets, a button maker, but one of the things we realized in this second room edition at the Annex is that there are already these built-in shelves that are larger, that um, are like cubbies, that are perfect. Uh, for an expansion that we wanted to do, but again, didn't have the space or the resources. And we have a volunteer who is very mechanical and he collects tools and he is going to be providing um, all kinds of tools to us to create a tool checkout program with um, power tools and gardening tools. And actually we wanna add some kitchenware too because Sometimes you just want to bake a bunt cake, but you don't want to buy the bunt cake mold necessarily. So we are having so much fun looking at all these items that and how to make it um, not a burden on staff and volunteers to make these resources access accessible. And I think um, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, the, the thing about these new spaces, it's like those dreams that you have, like when you're walking around your house and you realize, <laughs> I, had to, I have a whole other room I never knew about. <laughs> yeah. um, I have that dream all the time. And, and it's just, it's been fun to be able to do these things. Um, we are maxed out at our main library um, in terms of space, and we've been really creative and creating new space here, but, you know, it comes to the point where it, it's, you're, you know, you can't do that anymore. So th this is really exciting and it, it just, terms Sorry. of the opportunity to to do more things um and i know we're we're getting down to the we time here i think it's only 20. um Hi. but we want to kind of just share some pictures of some of our programs that we've um been doing over the years and 
you know, this job is amazing. And when you actually just stop and, and just take a breath and look at everything that, you know, we've been able to accomplish and inviting the community in and really giving them support. the space and the support and the resources that they need. Um, and I, I don't want to wait till the end to give a shout out to all of the librarians listening. Uh, thank you, all of you. And I hope you two are having fun at your jobs because we really, really are. Um, it's, it's really amazing. Um, just some of the pictures um, that there's, a, we have a return of the vultures uh, parade where actually we have a workshop going on right now downstairs. Um, it's, um, that the turkey vultures come every spring and somebody created an event with a parade and our workshop downstairs <laughs> is a paper mache workshop. For, so it's a parade workshop creating paper mache forms to walk in this parade. That's Main Street, they're walking down. And our, re our return of the vultures sign signifies spring and um, and they are actually, someone just spotted one, so that's perfect timing oh, because yeah. it's here. And then we'll also have an adult program on uh, the birds themselves, nature's cleanup crew, carrion eaters, and how they benefit uh, the environment. And then the um, shots of the band are the Bisbee High School band who um, on the top picture were playing on our balcony um, for the parade. And on the bottom picture, we're, we have an end of summer reading party at our, our city pool where the fire chief um, and police chief come in, and the firemen come and barbecue for us. And we have free passes for the pool. And last year the band came and played and you can see they're on their swimsuits. Um, but also playing for everybody at the pool. And uh, the <laughs> Handmaidens uh, is for Band Books Week. It's, it's one of our favorite uh, celebrations is um, just celebrating the freedom to read. And each year we've come up with uh, characters to dress up as. And we, um, from, from the book that we will, we will sit and discuss, and um, we do flash mobs out on Main Street just to raise awareness. and. Um, that was uh that's always a fun time uh this past year we were penguins from uh and tango mix three <laughs> um <laughs> we were outside on main street on a on a rainy september day um which is actually perfect for penguins um and it's it's kind of grown and and it's it's uh people uh you know randomly will spot us out there and you know scratch their heads and be like what's going on and um Exactly, it's just, we're, we're celebrating our freedom to read. And the pickleball rackets and balls and the bocce balls, those are um, new courts that were built. So we uh, check out the, that equipment so people can go play. Um, uh, in the upper left-hand corner is astronaut and children's author, Mark Kelly, who for uh, last summer's reading program, A Universe of Stories, um, was our guest author. Uh, that's taken from the front, but so Mark Kelly, um, uh, during the process of asking him to come, he actually declared his candidacy to run for the Senate of Arizona. So we ended up working um, side by side with his campaign manager. However, this was not a political event. This was an author reading and um, Mark brought his wife, Gabby Giffords, who used to be our Congresswoman. And there are about 100 people there. Um, and he read from Mousternaut. And then we did a Q&A and the questions uh, from the kids were amazing, amazing. Um, they asked him, what is your favorite planet? And as you can imagine, he said Earth. Um, and, uh it's always been a dream of mine to turn the library into a haunted library um, over Halloween. And um, that picture up in the right-hand corner is a picture of, um, it's a total transformation of the library. Um, two floors. Two floors for two hours. It's a, a lot of work. Um, the first year we had over 300 attendees. Um, and like Allison said, it's we work for the, um, the Builders Club um, from the high school, we worked together, and last year they did Twisted Fairy Tales 
Um, they plan a whole tour. They map out how to block off the stacks to make a maze, and they tell a story, and they create costumes and, and get actors or become the actors. Really phenomenal work. And just that last, the bottom picture of us in the cemetery was from summer reading program. We started taking the library out of the library on a series of field trips. And uh, we used Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children um, to go as our theme to go to the cemetery and take Victorian pictures. So uh, we were being photographed and we asked the photographer to please make it black and white. Um, I think, uh, and I'm just smiling here, but just talking about some of our programs. And I think uh, Allison and I are just, we, we're willing to try anything. And I think that's where, you know, and we find something that works, you know, you can grow upon that idea. And I think that's where our success has been. You know, we've had programs where, you know, no one has come and, you know, it's it hasn't all been. Or one person. Yeah. But even if we reach one person or three people, we are excited that um, I think that um, people have to remember, you know, weather or family or other events, you never know. You never know what's going to happen. So we just keep trying to find out what the community wants and needs and 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 remove barriers and fulfill our mission to support them and to sustain them in the best way possible. And part of that is experimenting and so and breaking boundaries ourselves and 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 learning new things ourselves. So when we went to ARSO last year um, to accept the award, that was such an amazing conference and such a privilege for us because we have a zero dollar um, professional development line in our budget. However, this year we have received a, a grant. We applied for a, a professional development grant and we are going to Wichita, Kansas in, uh, uh, is it September, October 2020? Awesome, yes. End of September, end of, where on my calendar here? Yes, end of September, first week of October. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> Yay. So we, we do want to invite, uh, if anyone has any questions or um, has, you know, heard something that they want more information about, uh, Allison and I are available. Um, we have our contact information, emails, and uh, telephone number. Um, please uh, reach out and contact us. We would love to hear from you. Um, I, I think that's the other lesson that we've learned over the past few years is that, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's probably a library out there that's done it already. And we've reached out to other um, organizations to see how they uh, do specific programs and offer services. And we've learned so much and uh, yeah. And that, you know, what works for us might not work for you, but mm -hmm. you can take these ideas and adapt them to Absolutely. best fit your staff and your physical space, your budget and your community needs. And I think the other thing Allison mentioned uh, just a little while back, it's uh, providing what the community, not only what they need, and that a lot of times that's what we concentrate on, but it's also what they want. Um, and that's sometimes the fun, ha the, the fun part of it um, is finding out what, what is fun for them. You know, it, it's, we, we do concentrate a lot on, on community needs and, and providing resources to address those needs, but also let's have fun together. Let's, let's, uh, let's do something um, and converse together. Let's, let's build community that way um, and just enjoying something together. Leisure time is as important as everything else. Oh, definitely. Everyone needs their downtime and their less brain power time. time. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's why we, I read. I mean, yeah. I love reading for that. Uh, actually, and actually, what you guys are just saying, that's what, that's what Big Talk from Small Libraries is all about, sharing, borrowing, um, getting ideas. Um, libraries are all about resource sharing, and everyone who is presenting here was happy for you to totally steal their ideas, as someone did comment earlier. I'm stealing that idea. Do it. Yes. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And as Jason said, um, we're happy to share how we created um, the, 
the contract for the Wi-Fi hotspot checkout form, how we created mm -hmm. the library patron card form. I mean, we are we absolutely want to um, offer assistance in supporting other libraries who are also, you know, um, you know, short on resources. Um, and also another shout out to um, Arizona libraries. Um, the resources that they provide to us across the state is phenomenal. Just an incredible group of people and um, through grants, through education opportunities, through their three-year Library Institute program. So um, I didn't really um, understand at first. Uh, I thought it, they were too far away from us being in the capital in Phoenix and that they wouldn't be interested in it as for, and that was just my misconception. Boy, was I wrong. They are <laughs> such amazing people and such a huge support. That's great. Yeah, that's what us, I mean, here in Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission, where we're at here, we are what you would call the state library, you just call the commission here. And we are here on the eastern side of the state in the capital, but we are the agent, state agents, library agency for the all libraries across the entire state and try to have what we can what we can do to support all of them and all their various needs which is very wide ranging yes <laughs> um we do have a few questions that have come in um that i think i'll have you answer here anybody have any questions use your question section to type them in and i'll grab them for jason and allison um we have a question about the science walk that you did who helped with that and what are some of the things that are in that science walk that you so actually um uh, that what I meant to add that on to the end of so part of the annex expansion it's again there are phases to it we're expanding into the second classroom mm -hmm. but as well as this being an abandoned school there's also a giant giant abandoned playground outside mm -hmm. in the back of the building and um, we are working with the school district as well as the science lab and some other partners um, to enter into an agreement with the city of Bisbee and the Bisbee Unified School District to create a, um, an outdoor park um, outside of the library and the science lab in the back of the building, which will be a literacy walk. It's a, it's a, com it's a large space, so it's a combination mm -hmm. of um, some science park uh, installations, mm -hmm. an outdoor classroom, um, a literacy walk, we're going to look at the history of the story. Some uh, gardens, so we have some gardening organizations, but also um, a solar panel garden, demonstration garden, which is where the plants underneath protect and keep up the panel. And the solar panel provides energy, but also protects the plants. It's very interesting. Yeah. So it'll be science, literacy, it'll be STEAM, basically as well as a giant mural that we're working on on the side of the building. Mm -hmm. So, and then we hope to do some sculptures and some other um, playground equipment. And we're going to be working with different organizations and different funding. But the way we've uh, looked at this, so looking at the overall plan seems huge and uh, intimidating. Lots of moving parts, it sounds like, yes. <laughs> yes, but we can divide out every part of it into a smaller project for one group to work on. Yeah. And if we have the it. overall yeah. plan. So this is similar to, I know, I know, I heard of lots of other libraries doing story walks. You have that as well. Or is that part well, of We want to look at the history of uh, storytelling. So starting with um, a large rock and uh, some uh, little a built-in box of chalk that people can draw, do their own cave drawings, drawing on that, mm -hmm. going to a um, circular storytelling area like a uh, oral hit, oral tradition of telling stories around a fire. We're not going to have a fire pit though, um, but um, it will be a dual purpose community gathering space as well as for outdoor classes for students to sit around and then going into um, papyrus and a uh, tablet. So a place to make clay tablets or work with the earth. Hmm. Um, we're, again, we're forming this idea. There are a lot of moving parts, but 
we are slowly but surely progressing on this. Yeah. So um, on the story walk, someone wants to know where you got the picture signage for that. Is that something you did yourself or is there from like the story walk? Um, no, we haven't created that yet. So okay. story walk, the actual organization, you buy the story from them and that goes in mm -hmm. to um, stands that are usually created by the library who does it. Mm -hmm. But we also have a lot of uh, local children's authors, a lot meaning a good, like a few for the amount of, um, for our population, uh, local story children's authors who are willing to collaborate with us in writing a story for us mm -hmm. or using their stories. So basically they will um, be helping donate copyright so we don't have to buy the licensing. Yeah, we're kind of going rogue. We're going to create our. We're going to create our own. We're going rogue. I guess we're that, that's fine. Oh yeah, lots of places do that. If you have the capabilities to do that, you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can't afford the copyright on Story Walk, so yeah. we're calling it Literacy Walk. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, question about the Seed Library. Uh, they want to know how you got started with doing that, doing your Seed Library. Well, we reached out to another. Um, a small rural library within our county system who had started one. Um, and like Allison said, one of our part-time workers uh, um, who is a master gardener, she, she took this on as a special project of hers and she reached out uh, to seed companies. It, it all started with donations and mm -hmm. small grants. Um, and all of a sudden we've got boxes and boxes of seeds on our table that you know we, we um, then repackage. Um, and not only that, it's um, local donations. So we also have a garden club that supports the seed library and helps to, um, you know. Teach people how to garden. And we have master gardeners from the U of A Cooperative Extension and Cochise College who come on, we don't have to pay them. They come and do presentations. So the garden club meets monthly. And then the uh, local nonprofit called the Bisbee Bloomers provided, um, they bought uh, these large, so we're downtown, we don't have an outdoor area. What we do have is a balcony. And we have these large tubs uh, along the balcony, both sides, which are like um, big uh, cattle watering troughs, but they're mm -hmm. filled with soil. And our uh, seed librarian, Kathy, she plants a spring garden and then a summer garden. And this past year, she did a small winter garden with Swiss chard, um, kale. And so that we had the preschool um, kids come and help plant that garden last spring. And then that grows. It's amazing to see a full, beautiful, bountiful garden on the balcony downtown. Wow. And if, if anyone's interested in, in starting one, uh, seed companies have been more than willing to um, give free seeds. And um, we're already, we're, we're restocking our, our, our library now. And we're, we're again, uh, Baker and um, Baker Creek Seeds is donating a bunch of seeds to it. So there, there don't be afraid to ask because we, we've gotten a lot of free seeds and, uh, again, the idea of the seed library is to um, to keep this a sustainable project. And um, you are, uh, we're teaching people how to harvest seeds and bring back seeds from their most successful and healthy plants. And the idea is to get these seeds acclimated to our climate. We're, we're, in, we're in the high desert. Um, it's a very uh, challenging growing area. And um, when we know a plant does well, that's what we want to keep in our library. And also te teaching people how to garden in this climate because it is possible. And the other thing is when we first thought of this idea, we thought, oh my gosh, this is so big. But then an even smaller rural library um, nearby, um, we talked to them about their seed library and it was basically, they started it in a shoebox, something the size of a shoebox. Yeah. And when we heard that, we thought, oh, we don't actually have to, um, like imagine this giant thing. We can start small and see how that works. And I, I love that idea of, you know, work with what you have and provide what you can. You can start small, even with a shoebox. Yeah, absolutely. Do what you use what you've got. Yeah. 
Uh, one last question we're going to ask here. Um, someone's questioning about the loaning out of the tools that you're doing. Um, what about insurance for that when people are using that? Are you covered by libraries? Um, um, that's a great question. We're still in the process of um, of creating this and going through the vetting process. We will uh, create a separate contract agreement. We have rules about being over 18 and not have any fines and all of that. But also we have a liability uh, release form that they will have to sign uh, and okay. cannot um, check out without that. Perfect. And this will go through our city attorney, our city manager and all of that. So it will be properly vetted uh, and until it is structured in a safe and manageable way, we will not um, start the program. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something other libraries are doing. So we, we yeah. are definitely going to reach out and talk to some other libraries that are doing something very similar and see what they do. Um, it's the, the best resources in another library. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I looked at the, I think it's Portland, Oregon has a library of things. I looked at their catalog and, and everything there, they ha provide their contracts and information. So we will be reaching out. Yeah, there's lots of places to get resources about that and um, how to do all these different things. So, all right, great. Thank you so much, Jason and Allison. I'm, I was thrilled to be able to have you guys uh, at the conference this year. Um, we always do try to bring whoever has been, and I think we've been successful this year, the most recent um, Best Small Library in America along. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having us. And one last word uh, for any library considering applying for Best Small Library is to just do it. We we did it and and amazingly we won and just it's a great exercise in in being able to write down some of the things the great things that you're doing and even if you don't win you've got language written already that's great for grants it's great for yes. you know showing what you do so you're do not it. too small it's you hard to small it's, and you are the best we we are honored to meet be amongst so many great libraries. Mm -hmm. It's hard to promote ourselves oftentimes. And exactly. This is a great way yeah. to do it. And that's why I actually was thrilled to have you guys on too. We've had, like I said, we've had the Best Small Libraries on and ALA Library Journal who does this award, uh, Baker Taylor, their definition is populations under 25,000, which to my brain is really big. <laughs> and yours that's is what we said too. We thought we were yeah, you guys are what we're, I think of when I think of who should be the best small library in America. We've had many of them that are 22,000, 26,000 population served. And yeah. So congratulations to you guys. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you so much. All right.